feel the matter of dice and Mr. Thomas. Good morning, my lords. Uh, in this matter, I appear for the appellants along with Mr. Helm. Mr. Wolanski and Mr. DeWild appear for the respondents. Thank you. Uh, as the court will know, this is an appeal in a libel action arising out of a substantial item on the Channel 4 News, which was broadcast on the 10th of February of last year at 7 pm as the lead item. On the 31st of October of last year, Mr. Justice Nicklin determined that based solely on intrinsic evidence, um, the broadcast did not refer to the appellants. Uh, the court has a transcript of the broadcast at uh, um, tab 11 of the core bundle uh, and a link to the full Channel 4 news on that day, which I hope it wasn't too difficult to download. It took, me about, it took me about 20 minutes. But <laughs> um, permission to appeal was refused by the judge, but granted by my Lord, Lord Justice Warby on the 19th of December of last year. Uh, and the court will have seen that Although my Lord refused to stay the judge's directions uh, um, going forward, uh, the judge himself subsequently ordered a stay. Uh, that's a supplemental bundle, tab 8. So the future progress of the action awaits the decision of this court on the appeal. My Lords, this was a broadcast, uh, a news, substantial news broadcast about Dyson referred to as one of Britain's most iconic companies facing legal action over claims of abuse and exploitation in its former uh, its supplier's Malaysian factory. Uh, um, I'm sorry to say that, the, as, as I'm sure very often happens to members of the court, the appeal bundle of authorities is very full. 34 cases, including three decisions of the House of Lords, one from the High Court of Australia and one from the Supreme Court of Canada. But in reality, we say that the question to be asked is simple uh, and appears now to be uncontroversial, which is, does the broadcast reasonably lead people, persons acquainted with the appellants, to believe that they are the Dyson companies referred to? The, the, the judge did not apply that test. It, it, instead, he embarked on a sophisticated but erroneous analysis uh, uh, based on what he appears to have believed was uh, at one point he referred to as the strictness of the rule of reference in relation to companies uh, uh, um, and in doing so he left out an absolutely crucial point and my lords we say this is central to this appeal and central to the result uh, um, the fact that the broadcast refers to a British company. Uh, it's a point which, incidentally, is not dealt with at all in, in my friend's skeleton argument in this court. It, it's worth, uh, at the outset, just highlighting those references so, so that the, the court can see uh, how important that is. But the, the, the headline, my lords, I think it's the online version, uh, and but it's pleaded at paragraph five of the particulars of claim at page 116 um, is Dyson that's at tab 9 of the Thank you. Uh, uh, um, Dyson one of Britain's best known firms faces claims of abuse and exploitation its former suppliers of M Malaysia's factory uh, um, in, in the broadcast itself looking at the transcript uh, uh, um, the viewer is told uh, uh, at the outset, paragraph four. Uh, um, Where is the transcript? Page? The transcript is at tab 11, my lord, thank I'm you. so sorry, page 132. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, the, the, uh, as the very first thing said when the broadcast, after the introduction, it is one of Britain's most iconic companies, uh, and then goes on to talk about the claim uh, um, that's being made. And then we have a, a over the page, 133, uh, um, Darcini, uh, Sony re exclusive report, uh, uh, um, and, and paragraph seven, uh, um, Dyson is a house, the, the, the first paragraph there, Dyson is a household name globally and a flagship company in Britain. Uh, that, um, that's at 540. Um, that also shows the person making the voiceover outside a store marked Dyson. 
Yes. Right. Is, where does that feature on the transcript? It's at uh, it's at one hundred thirty three seven. My lord, I think that's the is that the one where. But the transcript doesn't actually refer to that bit. It doesn't show you the no, what's in the you. background. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and then the report just before the interview. The, 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 there's an interview, uh, as, as the court will know, uh, um, w with um, Michel Shi, uh, um, and um, the very last thing that's said is. Dyson is now facing legal action. Britain's favourite vacuum maker is having to clean up its reputation. The, the, as pleaded in the particulars of claim, the two appellant companies, Dyson Limited and Dyson Technology, are the, the page, this is page, tab 9, page 115. Uh, uh, um, I'm oh, sorry, 116. The second claim, the first claimant is now out of the action, as, as the court knows. Dyson Technology is a UK based company. It holds the intellectual property, technology, brand rights, uh, um, employs a number of Dyson's executive team, and retains advisors to protect reputation. Uh, and the third claimant, that's Dyson Limited, is Dyson's UK trading company. Uh, uh, we say that. Uh, uh, the, an ordinary reasonable viewer acquainted with one or other of these companies would reasonably believe that it is the British company being referred to and indeed would believe correctly as it turned out that it was the British company about to be sued. The, the, um, the viewer is told that legal action is pending and although it's not said in terms that it's pending in the English court uh, an English solicitor, Mr. Holland, gives, uh, um, speaks to the camera. Uh, Lee Day is referred to, and we say a reasonable viewer would correctly infer that what was being threatened was an English legal action. Well, also, although this is a forensic point, but I don't apologise for make it, making it, uh, uh, um, the, the first time that reference was raised was not by these respondents, but by the judge. The, 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 um, it, it was the judge who suggested that reference be dealt with as a preliminary issue, although you see from his judgment he obviously rather had second thoughts about whether that was a sensible course. Uh, we, have, we, we, have we got the um, defendant's statement of case? Uh, um, it's in supplemental, supplemental bundle. Uh, oh no, my lord, I'm so sorry, we don't. I don't think we do. No. I'm just trying to get clear in my mind what the sequence of events was, because we know that we we see in the judgment there's a statement or an account of the defendant's case on the issue, but there's no defence yet. No. no. It, it was agreed that there'd be the usual preliminary the issues. issues. Okay. That is the to say, deferral of the defence. Quite so. To allow the opportunity for a, 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 an offer. Y yes, but the the parties approached the, the judge to make an order by consent for, for trial of the usual preliminary issues, that is to say, uh, uh, um, meaning uh, uh, um, defamatory at common law and fact opinion. And then the judge came back and said, what about dealing with reference as well? So, so uh, my Lord, I, make, I make that point only because uh, one assumes that the, def the respondents are reasonable people and, and, and it reasonably didn't occur to them that reference was an issue until the judge raised it. But well, I say well, it's my, a, my question really was that, that statement of case post-dated the judge. It did indeed. It did, yes. It, that, that statement of case was, was in the usual way served. The judge gave the, his, his usual directions for the service of, of, a, of a case on, on the preliminary issues, uh, and it was then served. Can I just also clarify one aspect of what happened at the preliminary issue? Because of the slightly unusual way in which it became formulated. No evidence would have been required on the meaning defamatory common law and fact and opinion. Then is added on the reference after you, you say the judge's suggestion that we are where we are and we now have a judgment to, to deal with. But there was no evidence called on the preliminary the, There was, it, it was, the, the, the judge originally listed a hearing to, to decide what was going to happen at the preliminary uh, um, issue trial, so a preliminary, preliminary hearing, 
uh, it was that that was uh, uh, um, by agreement. It was uh, uh, the parties agreed that there would be no evidence at the, on the question of reference. So the question of extrinsic reference, as the judge helpfully calls it, uh, 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 was was not to be dealt with, which requires evidence, was not to be dealt with at this hearing at all. So what is the status for the purpose of the preliminary inquiry? of the pleaded averments at paragraphs 2 and 7a and 7b that you've taken us to? Because there would be, um, effectively, a, um, we haven't got to the defence yet. Yes, well, those, th those obviously have to be assumed to be true. Uh, um, uh, 7a and 7b are, are, are not, strictly speaking, relevant because they're, they were part of the extrinsic reference yeah. case, which, which we, we added in prior to the preliminary issue hearing, uh, as, as a fallback position, uh, um, although they weren't before the judge, uh, um, the judge nevertheless decided that they should be struck out, uh, uh, as the court would have seen from his order, uh, uh, because the, 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 they weren't um, good enough, and, and ordered us to replead the extrinsic uh, reference case, which we did, uh, um, and there was to be a hearing of that in January of this year, but then the judge uh, um, as I indicated, adjourned, stayed, stayed that, and so we've actually pleaded uh, uh, um, and served a, a draft re-re-amended uh, uh, um, defence on extrinsic reference, which is rather more extensive than the one before the court. But as I understand it, your case on intrinsic reference is that the hypothetical reasonable reader acquainted with these claims would be aware of the facts that you've pleaded as preliminary yes. averments. Yes. Um, but because they're, they're not admitted as facts, um, the judge should have and we should proceed on the footing, on the assumption that they're true. My Lord, although yes. Although they remain to be proved. Yes. Or no. Yes. Well, that's a very odd sort of preliminary issue, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> where you have a trial of a preliminary issue. I mean, you are meant to deal... I, I understand how we all ended up there. And I don't think anyone is arguing on the other side that, that we should do anything other than assume it's true, but that's more strikeout than preliminary issue. Yes, it's, it's as, as, as the court would have seen from the judgment, I, I, one gets the impression the judge rather regretted his decision to, to, to order You've a preliminary... you made that point, Mr Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 well, the, the, it, it, is a, it is a slightly odd situation, but the... the, the uh, um, in practice, the, the, it doesn't seem that the averments at, at um, paragraph 2 of the amended particulars, page 116, are in fact controversial. Uh, um, and um, had, had more clear attention been directed to it, it perhaps then admitted facts could have, if the judge wanted to go down this course, admitted facts could have been factored into the determination of preliminary issue. Thank you. Well, the judge, the judge, it's obvious from his judgment, the judge uh, 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 had some concern that we hadn't pleaded details about the corporate structure of Dyson, and he didn't know how many companies there were, or which was the, uh, uh, um, the parent company, and so on. Uh, um, my, Lord, our, my Lord's, our answer to that is reasonable viewers don't worry about that kind of thing. People don't watch the Channel 4 news thinking, gosh, I wonder what the corporate structure is. Uh, um, they see the broadcast once. They're not over-analytical. They don't sub submit it to piecemeal analysis. They, they form a, an impression. Uh, and we, we say that impression, the impression they form if they're acquainted with these claimants is that they're the subject of the broadcast. My Lord, I, I want to begin by saying something relatively briefly about the law. I, I say relatively briefly because although it was hotly contested before the judge, uh, um, most of it now seems to be common ground. Uh, uh, um, the, the, um, the judge says at paragraph 17 of his judgment, is it convenient for me just to give the paragraph references to the judgment or would you? Court prefer the bundle well, we, references. We, 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 we have read, read it carefully, but it's very helpful for you to say whatever you want about it. 
Well, no, I was, what I was just wondering was whether your lordship would like the bundle reference as well as the judgment paragraph. Paragraph reference. Paragraph, yeah. uh, paragraph 17, uh, um, he says that the, that the principles are the subject of broad agreement. Uh, um, well, the, the, the basic point that uh, um, some, uh, something is only a, a defamatory publication uh, um, must be referred to uh, the claimant it is obviously uh, um, a matter of complete agreement. What wasn't agreed was the crucial point about that the ordinary reasonable viewer is a person uh, acquainted with the claimant. This was a point taken by us before the judge, not addressed by the respondents in their skeleton below at all, uh, and only mentioned by the judge in passing on one occasion uh, and, and doesn't form part of his reasoning. The, we summarise the general principles in our skeleton at paragraph 30, which is uh, at tab 2, pages 29 to 30. Uh, uh, um, those now don't seem to be in uh, um, the subject of any uh, substantial disagreement between the parties, and the respondent skeleton <coughs> largely traverses the same ground at um, paragraphs 25 to 38. The, the, the point as to the, the reasonable, relevant reasonable reader is one acquainted with the claimant. I'm not going to take the, the, the court to the uh, authorities at this stage because it's not doesn't seem to be controversial. Uh, uh, the, 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 the leading authorities are very well known. Uh, uh, um, Hulton and Jones, Knopfler and London Express and Morgan and Odoms. I, I, I do make the point, and it's important, uh, that, that these authorities don't clearly distinguish between intrinsic and extrinsic reference. Uh, those cases are all extrinsic reference cases. But the principle um, applies whether the test of a uh, as to uh, someone reasonably acquainted, reasonable person acquainted with the claimants, applies whether it's one, whether it's an intrinsic or extrinsic reference case. And uh, um, the, the point is clearly stated by my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Warby in Economu and De Freitas at paragraphs 9 to 10. Uh, um, that's authorities 21, page 500. But uh, uh, unless the court wishes, I don't propose to, doesn't seem to be controversial, so I don't propose to take the court. Uh, um, to it. Um, the relevant hypothetical reader is one who's acquainted with the claimant. Uh, um, it means more than, that means more than just knowing that the claimant exists. They know something about the claimant, but what they know uh, 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 um, depends on all the circumstances and they aren't taken to know everything about the claimant. It's, uh, the, the, it's famously said in the cases about, you, you, your lordships may remember the curious case of Mr. Artemis Jones and Holton and Jones uh, 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 um, the, the, in, in Dieppe with a woman that wasn't his wife, uh, uh, um, referred to as a church warden from Peckham. He wasn't from Peckham and he wasn't a church warden, but nevertheless, it was sufficient that the, 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 the um, Persons acquainted with him would take him to be the person referred to. We're, although it's not controversial, perhaps I just mentioned this point that we say the reasons for this are principle are obvious because even in this absolutely standard media case where one has a reference uh, uh, to an individual by name and perhaps an occupation. It's highly unlikely that every reader would know who was being referred to. Even if you took a, a, a person known to a substantial proportion of the population, um, the Prime Minister or David Beckham, there are going to be people who don't know who they are. And, and, and my eye was caught by a case which I, my Lord Lord Justice Warby was, was in in 2011, the, the case of Mr when Mr Dominic Raab MP brought a, a claim against the Mail on Sunday, uh, he was a newly elected MP. And it seems highly unlikely that 
most or, or all of Mail on Sunday readers would at that stage have known who he was. But there was no question of it being a, an extrinsic reference case. He was named, he was an MP, and some people would have known. But also there's no difference between the test that's applied to corporations and, and the test that's applied to individuals. Um, we say that perhaps there's some confusion in the judgment about this. C can I just draw attention to, uh, again, again, this, these points are maybe well known to the court. It's perhaps just important to emphasise them. There are some points of distinction in relation to a corporation. That the first point made by the judge at paragraph 29 um, it is the fact that a company suffers damage is not of itself a ground for it bringing a libel claim. Uh, he refers to an Australian case called Sungrave, uh, 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 which mentions a report about a particular model of car, which obviously would injure the dealers, but is not defamatory. Uh, 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 um, th this doesn't apply in the present case. This is about Dyson. Uh, secondly, uh, um, sometimes there are cases where the company doesn't trade, so it's got no reputation to damage. Uh, this, I'll come on to that in a, in a moment in relation to a case relied on by the judge. Uh, uh, um, thirdly, there's a, there's a long line of concern where people are bringing bring cases in the name of corporations when really they should be in the name of individuals. Really the individuals are being defamed. Um, the, the case of a, a elite models in the, which is in the bundle of authorities is one of those such cases. Uh, th this is not such a case here. Uh, uh, um, and the fourth point is, uh, and this is rel crucially relevant to this case, that, that where the company is part of a corporate group, then difficulties uh, um, potential, potentially arise. Uh, uh, um, it's perhaps just, again, it's not, I think, necessary to dwell on this point, but perhaps just useful to refer to, to Gatley, uh, uh, where the law is summarised. That's at uh, tab 35 of the authorities bundles. Authorities bundle, page 881. Happy to say that the passage is actually sidelined by both parties. Uh, uh, um, shows it works sometimes. Uh, however, uh, um, where the words complained of do not specifically identify the, uh, the claimant company, and that company is one of several in a larger group with similar names, the claim may fail unless a reasonable person could think that the claimant company was sufficiently referred to, the words sufficiently identified all or some of the companies in the group. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, and that's a correct statement of the law we say but obviously needs to be factored in the point about um, acquainted with the with the claimant so my lords the basic <coughs> legal position is common ground there's just one small point of emphasis that it is different and perhaps I should just mention at this stage um, in their skeleton at paragraph 45 the respondents rely on what they call the important judgment of Lord Justice Farwell in Jones and Holton to suggest that there are further, apart from whether the words would reasonably lead persons acquainted with the plaintiff to believe he was the person referred to, there are two further key elements of the test. Uh, 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 um, well, I, I, I don't want to waste time on, on, on analysing Lord Justice Farwell's judgment. It, it, the, the court may know it's actually quite a controversial judgment. And in the subsequent case of Newstead and London Express newspapers, the master of the roles, Sir Wilfrid Green, uh, uh, um, basically said that it was inconsistent with the ratio of the case and that Lord Justice Farwell had been led into error. He, 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 um, he has the view that if a someone unintentionally refers to 
one individual. There's no libel if there was a real individual which it also referred to. If there really was an Artemis Jones in, um, in Dieppe, then um, the, the, the claimant, the plaintiff in that case, couldn't have brought a case. That's wrong. That's not the law. But, but anyway, and, and some, so quite a lot of what he said. It couldn't have been decided the way it was if that was the law. It, yes. And, and, and it, it's, well. There was another, there was another Harold Newstead. In <laughs> there was a. Roughly in Campbell. Indeed, there was another Harold Newstead in Scampwell, which is what Newstead was all about. But, but, but the, the, the reason I just say, refer to that is because sometimes when Lord Justice Farwell is talking about circumstances in, in his judgment, he's talking about circumstances that might, might lead you to identify the real person, which is a complete red herring. But well, the, point, the, the fundamental point I make is this, that there are no further elements to the test. But the, 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 the respondent's suggestion that somehow you can add additional qualifications to the test of uh, whether the words would lead a person acquainted with the claimant to believe, to believe that he was the person referred to is it, 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 simply wrong. It, it, that there is it's a basic, simple test. Well, can I say now something about the judgment? If you finish with the law, can I just ask you yes. this question? Where in the jurisprudence does the reference to in, in extrinsic and intrinsic first come up? Uh, in this case. This judgment? Yes. Was there anything that um, the judge had used to piggyback on for that? Those Not that I'm aware of. No. Uh, um, it, it's, a, it's, it's novel but helpful. It, it, it's, it's, as as the, the court may, may have seen, the, the authorities... The term reference innuendo only comes in relatively, rec relatively recently in the case law. Uh, 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 um, but but the, the matter being complicated by the fact that all the, all the cases through to Morgan are, are, are jury cases, so, yeah. so, so they're capability cases. And, and in all the cases, I think, some evidence was called. Yes. Um, and the question that was going through my mind about that is, and I'm not sure the cases tell us the answer, why? Why were those things called? Was it called because it was necessary in order to make out the case on liability? Or was it called for the obvious reason that the jury wasn't likely to award much in damages unless they were persuaded that the claimant was not only uh, identifiable, but also identified in the minds of readers and therefore suffered actual damage to his reputation? Um, well, uh, what, what's your submission on, on the common law about quantum of damage if no evidence is called of, about actual identification? Well, uh, uh, well, the authorities are clear. You, you don't have to call evidence as to identification. Uh, um, a, a, and uh, damages depend on the usual uh, um, factors. In, in a, in a, if, if it's a, a reference innuendo case, an extrinsic reference case, then, then you have to put some material before the court, uh, um, identifying those who have the special knowledge to be able to identify the claim. Uh, uh, um, but but, but as, as your Lordship will know, there's, there's some ongoing and unresolved debate as to whether actually how, how that helps, because the test is reasonableness and the fact that, that, the, the fact that some individual thinks that the, that the claimant is the person referred to. That, that may be an unreasonable individual. And well, it's a bit anomalous, isn't it? It, it is. Given, given the rule in relation to meaning. Yes. And, 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 Although and, the rule in relation to meaning is somewhat debated. It is. But, but the, 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 the judgments in, in Morgan and Odoms are, are, are very interesting because, because in, 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 in that case, in the, the, the dissenting members of the House of Lords say, well, look, these people who've been called, who, who, who saw the, the claimant with the, with, with the girl, are really being completely unreasonable. Well, why are they? Why? Why is that relevant to, to what's reasonable? They're, they're, it's just ridiculous. Uh, 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 whereas the the, the the majority say, "Oh, it's all for the jury, and, and we don't have to worry about it." But tr true, it, true it is that, that there is no discussion in the cases, whatever, as far as I'm aware, of what evidence you, you might want to want to or have to call in an intrinsic reference. Case, no. although as your lord as your lordship says, such, such evidence may be relevant to damages. Well, 
Well, in that Viscount Simon gets close to that, where he distinguishes between the first question, was it capable of referring to the individual, and then the fact that you then had some evidence from people that misled the jury and the judge. Yes. Because he said there, there was nothing that could refer to the appellant, and the fact that some people took it to refer to the appellant is neither here nor there. Yes, well, exactly. They're the unreasonable, <laughs> they're the unreasonable readers, mm -hmm. and, and so, 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 so you can't, you, you can't call it in an English court a reasonable man. <laughs> so evidence from such a witness can't be produced. No, exactly, well, that was a, a, that's a good example of a case where uh, uh, um, the court was drawn into error by, by evidence of that sort. So, my lord, my lord, the, the, in, in the judgment, as I said, the judge begins by saying that, that much is common ground, but he doesn't uh, uh, pose what we say is the, is the right test. Uh, and he, he, um, he then makes what we say are a number of errors in his um, uh, analysis of the law. Uh, the, the first uh, error we... Sorry to interrupt before you get into the errors. Where do you say the judge sets out the text that he's applying, that you've said is wrong? Well, 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 well he, he's, he's, he, he, deals, he, he deals with the test really... Uh, um, not in his analysis of the law, but when he's towards the, the, the um, when he talks about his decision, uh, 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 paragraph fifty, he says that Mr. Tomlinson oversimplifies the principles. It's got to be some consideration of the factual position, uh, and and then the, the test is he, the test he he, um, he appears to apply is the test whether the person would be identified by the readers of the subject of the allegation. And, and then he goes on to analyse the key messages and then on that basis to, to say what the, wh who the broadcast refers to. Well, if, if, if you're not the subject of the allegation, it doesn't concern you. Yes, yes, but, but the, 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 there's the... the Obviously, in one sense, who is the subject of the allegation is is crucially relevant. But but he he doesn't in any at any stage in that section of his judgment deal with the position of someone who's acquainted with the claimants, and and that's fundamentally where he goes wrong. So that's the the test the part of the test he misses out. Yes, thank you. And, 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 and my Lord, I, I, I'm going to deal with this a bit later, but, but just, to, just to make this point, of course, in one sense, to say who is the target of the allegations, who is the subject of the allegations, a perfectly proper question to ask. But, but if, if you, as, as we say the judge does, if you turn that into a, a, a sophisticated analysis of what actually is going on in the broadcast, and, and then, and then in, in this case, he's trying to you know, work out which company might be involved in what activity. That's not what the reasonable reader does. I'll, I'll come back to that if I may. Uh, um, How does the, the... I understand the point you're making about the, the test is a person acquainted with the claimants. I understand that. But in the context of a corporate group, does that mean that any company in the group will always be satisfied because, you, you, because you're starting with someone who's positive to be acquainted with that, that company. No, I mean, I mean the, the, you know, in, in any group of companies, there'll be, and indeed there is in Dyson, I don't think it's controversial for me to say so, there's a company called Dyson Estates, right, which deals with property. Right. A person acquainted with Dyson Estates would not reasonably believe that it was the subject of the allegations in the broadcast. It would be entirely unreasonable for them to think such a thing. Uh, and, you know, e equally Dyson Finance and, and you know, the, uh, the host of other Dyson companies, if you knew anything about any of them, you would think, well, it's nothing to do with them. But, but, yes, but, and, and Andre is an example where the company didn't exist. Yes, at yes. At the time of the alleged wrongdoing. Yes, well, e e exactly. And, and if, if you're acquainted with the company, you, you, and, and you, you know it was only incorporated last week, you know it can't possibly have done anything wrong last year. Uh, 
uh, uh, um, well, this is perhaps a, perhaps a small point in the in the context because it doesn't seem to do much work. But the the, the judge identifies at paragraphs 23, 24 of his judgment what he calls an intermediate category between intrinsic and extrinsic reference. I say it doesn't seem to do much work. He doesn't really rely on it as part of his analysis, but it, it, it shows his. There's a re really a question of whether he's really thinking along the right lines if he, uh, when he identifies such a category, because there's no support for the existence of such a category in the authorities. I'll come back, if I may, to his reliance on the Australian case, because that's more important. It, paragraphs 27 to 28, um, again, he appears to cast doubt on the appropriateness of the, uh, of the test uh, um, that reasonably lead persons acquainted with the claimant who is the person referred to. Uh, 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 paragraphs uh, uh, 27 and 28. I, I accept, uh, um, my friend makes this point in his skeleton, I accept he doesn't say so in terms, but he, he, he says it's important that not for was an, uh, an extrinsic, revid uh, um, extrinsic evidence uh, ex uh, reference innuendo case. Uh, uh, um, but he then goes on to say, where the publication complained of clearly identifies but does not name the target of the defamatory allegations. It's an intrinsic, uh, um, intrinsic reference case. Uh, 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 and then he goes on to talk about David Jones. Sorry. He then... The, we say the discussion that follows shows that the, he's really operating on the wrong lines. In, in paragraph 28, he, he talks about, he, he quotes the, the example given by Paris, the, the Australian example of a, it's the middle of paragraph 28. If using the example from Paris, they happen to be 100 companies in the David Jones corporate structure, only the company that actually operated a department store could bring a defamation claim. That's not right, because, because the question is not what actually happened. The question is what reasonable readers believed happened. Uh, uh, um, and, and indeed, a, a point the judge himself made uh, uh, um, in an earlier case, uh, some years earlier, uh, uh, um, and it's perhaps just worth turning it up, it's at uh, um, paragraph it's, I'm so sorry, tab 23 of the authorities bundle, a case called thehut.com against Trinity Mirror. And at page 592, uh, um, I, I just draw attention to paragraph 15 of that 592. Where, where he says that purpose of to make clear that in defamation the question is whether or not the ordinary reasonable reader would understand the words to be referring to the particular company perfectly possible depending on the facts then they're referring to more than one company in fact we say that's what happened sorry which paragraph is that? 15 at paragraph 592 but, but what I wanted to mention in this context was uh, um, paragraph 29 at 594 where he makes the point we say correct it is not relevant legally who turns out to be in the position be in the position in terms of who manufactures the product because it is what the reason the reader understands the position to be taking the John Lewis example if the reader mistakes the relevant claim to be company A when it's company B in fact, the relevant party, it does not matter. <coughs> what matters is who the reader thinks is being referred to by the words complained of. That's right. Uh, uh, um, now, now, Well, in, in the Paris case, it would be the company or companies responsible for operating the store where the cockroaches were to be found. What, what and, the, and then that, the, the, on your case, um, identification would depend on the hypothetical reasonable reader's approach to that, bearing in mind what they 
the, the basic knowledge they had about the, the claimants. Yes, but, but, the, the, right? the, but yes, the point I'm making here is that in, in the Paris case, it's perfectly possible that the hypothetical reasonable reader could, different readers could identify different companies. That, that, that you don't, the, the judge says, uh, uh, only the company that actually operates the department store could bring a defamation claim. That's not right. It's the actually yeah. you're focusing on, isn't it? Yes, yes, because, because if everybody, if, every, if, if emblazoned outside the store it says David Jones, David Jones PLC or whatever the right name is in Australian company law, uh, 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 reasonable readers may believe they operate the store when in fact it turns out to be some shell company that's or some other company that's does something completely different as well. I mean, the, the point I'm making is you see there that the judge is, 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 um, is falling into, into error already. Uh, uh, and then... Is, is, to talk this, is it, would it be right to say that only the company that actually operates the department store is likely to be able to win a defamation claim worth bringing? Well, but, but Lord, I know it's not what the judge said. But Lord, no, because because if if the if the position is that 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 and the court accepts that the reading public reasonably believe that uh, there is a company called David Jones Store Operations that's operating the store, the fact that it doesn't and and it may be cause very substantial damage. It, the fact it doesn't it doesn't matter. Um, he, he then, at paragraph 31, and this is, uh, uh, my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Dingerman has already, in substance, come to this point, that when, I, when the judge applies the test at paragraph 50, he's really deriving it from euro money, paragraph 31. And, and he underlines the words the subject of the allegations. I, I, as I say, I'll say more about that in a moment, but, but the, the test is, what does the reason, you, your lordships know what I say the test is, and that's not quite the right way of putting it. Uh, uh, he, he, then, he then goes on at paragraph, uh, uh, um, and, and he was, this case was cited by Mr. Walensky, as he says, paragraph 32, to refer to Palace Films, uh, um, decision of um, Justice McCullum, who I see is potential candidate for the Chief Justice of Australia uh, um, in the near future, uh, uh, who was then the judge in charge of the defamation list in New South Wales, a and a, a case which the, the judge was obviously obviously thought was particularly important. Uh, um, he, he he says. He, he, he says in, in the, the first two lines of that paragraph, a further Australian case that demonstrates the strictness of the rule uh, um, so far as it applies to companies. Well, again, th that's a misdirection. There is no strictness of the rule. It's the same rule whether it's a company or an individual. Uh, um, and he, he, he regards this, as, as you can see later in the judgment, as a case, as a case which is... Uh, uh, um, very close to the present one uh, and, and very persuasive and we say he's clearly wrong about that and it's perhaps um, just worth spending a moment on seeing why that's wrong the, 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 the case is at tab 33 of the authorities bundle if I can summarise it in this way um, it was a case um, arising out of, of articles in a journal called the Australian Financial Review, which dealt with the film distribution industry in Australia, and referred to a number of film distributors, including Palace Films, just, just those words, nothing else. It, it, mm -hmm. it, uh, and it was clear that all three, artic all three articles, that, that Palace Films was an entity which carried on the business of film distribution. Uh, um, uh, and there was a extensive dis discussion of the conduct of that business which said to be defamatory. It ultimately ended up, I think, in more than half a dozen decisions of the, of the um, Australian courts arising out of those articles. But, uh, um, the, 
the company that carried on that business, that is to say, film distribution, as the judge explains at paragraph 5 of her judgment, which is on 839, is not Palace, it's not the claimant Palace Films Pty Limited, but a different company, uh, uh, um, Palace Enterprises Pty Limited. Uh, uh, um, and that company, because of the Australian rule against defamation claims being brought by trading corporations, that company couldn't bring a, beyond a certain size, that company couldn't uh, uh, bring a claim. That's section 9 of the Defamation Act. I'm not sure whether it's a, I think it's an act applying only to New South Wales. But anyway, uh, at that stage, or perhaps it's a piece of Commonwealth legislation. Anyway, the... the, the, the um, that company couldn't have brought a claim. So the question was whether the reference to Palace Films adequately named the, play, the plaintiff company without resort to particulars of identification, in other words, whether it was an intrinsic reference case. The, the, the judge held that it was not, uh, and that's at paragraph 20. Uh, uh, um, uh, and that's the passage that's cited by the judge in his judgment. Uh, uh, um, the, the, the judge appears to have been proceeding, see paragraph 10, on the incorrect assumption that if the plaintiff is not named, the case is bound to be one of extrinsic reference, which of course isn't right. Uh, um, you can have an, extrin an intrinsic reference case with no name, the Prime Minister. Uh, uh, um, a description is as good as a name. But the judge appears to have accepted, if one looks at paragraph 20, the, the judge appears to have accepted that if the full company name had been used, then the plaintiff company would have had a claim. Uh, and the problem was the omission of the full company name, so it wasn't clear whether it was a company or not. Of course, that doesn't apply here because it's perfectly clear a company is involved. But what the, what the judge didn't do was to consider the position of the reasonable reader acquainted with the plaintiff. Uh, um, which she, judge? Mr uh, Justice Nick? No, no, I'm, well, I'm so sorry, I'm McCullum. I'm, I'm talking about the Australian case still. Yes, so, yeah. um, had, had she considered that test, she would have reached the same conclusion that my Lord, Lord Justice Warby reached in Untrade, which is anybody acquainted with that company knows it doesn't trade. So it couldn't possibly be the, be the person, be the company referred to in the article. Well, more specifically, it's not, it's not the operator of the business. Well, well, e even, but even if you didn't know, even if you didn't know that, if you knew it was a non-trading company, uh, you, 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 you would know. So, so, so she analyzes the fact that this, in, in the context of, 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 of innuendo, but the, 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 she, she could have reached the same conclusion more straightforwardly by applying the Nutford test in the same way, as I say, my Lord did in, in, in the Andre case, because anybody with an acquaintance would know it couldn't be the company that, that was the subject of an allegation of wrongdoing. And, and that's a, it's not, a, a, a um, not a special rule applied to corporate claimants. It's just a, an application of, we say, the standard rule. So the judge, when the judge says at paragraph 54 of his judgment, uh, 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 um, the, 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 the case is analogous to Palace Films and the result is the same, he, he's, he, he's fallen into error. And it's it's 
there's a series, as I say, a series of he's misled himself by not focusing on the on, on the proper test and instead focusing on the test of exclusively on the test of what is the uh, uh, um, broadcast directed to. As films was a painting style, was it? Um, I, 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 well, as I understand it, the, the, the article just referred to Palace films generally. I, yes, well, we don't know whether, whether it was a trading name or just the, the way that the article referred to. There's the some films. argument about whether whether the, the, the non-trading company would have to have licensed the use of the trading name to the trading company and, and, and so on. But uh, it was an attempt to get round the Australian statute by, by, by uh, avoiding a claim by a company which was barred from bringing libel claims. But, but, but the judges, the, 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 as it were, the ratio of this part of the decision is, is that it wasn't being referred to because its full corporate name wasn't used, which is, 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 is not, the, we say, not the right analysis at all. But the, the right analysis is what someone reasonably acquainted and thought I'm repeating myself. Uh, um, so you came to the right result for the wrong reason. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, um, sub subsequently, uh, uh, um, Mr. Zecola, uh, uh, um, I think they're brothers. The Zecolas carried on the action, and, and, and there were then endless disputes about what the words meant, and uh, and so on. But the, 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 the two directors. Yes. Yeah. Well, we can see that at the end. Yes. Uh, um, the the the, um, the respondents seek to defend the judge's approach. This is at paragraph fifty-seven of their skeleton. Uh, uh, um, saying that he he indeed used the ordinary reasonable reader test. Uh, um, he certainly refers to uh, paragraph twenty of his judgment to Morgan. Which is, uh, and, and of course, that's the where, where the House of Lords make it clear that that same test applies in relation to preferences to meaning. But what, what, what is the top of page, page 86 of the core bundle? Uh, but of course, what he doesn't do is, is, is add the gloss of reasonably acquainted with. Uh, 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 um, The, the, he, he doesn't. He doesn't apply that, and the, the, re, the respondents don't challenge that. They, they don't challenge the fact that the judge missed out a crucial part of the relevant test, and we say that therefore it's it's plain that the judge applied the wrong test, and that this court can reach its own view. Um, can I just say a, a few words about the? Uh, um, the pleadings and, and the question of root libel. Uh, um, there's a criticism that we somehow should have pleaded uh, um, a case to make out a group libel claim. We we don't accept that. The the the, the judge also apparently criticises our pleading, which we we don't really understand, because so far as I'm aware, and certainly I've not found anything in the case law to suggest anything to the contrary, the only thing you need to plead in an intrinsic reference case is that the words were published of and concerning the plaintiff, the claimant, which is what we pleaded. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't have to uh, go into some explication of why that's the case. Of course, if the point is taken, th th there's nothing to, s to stop the defendants taking the point in their defence. And if they take the point, then obviously relevant facts can be pleaded in reply. Uh, and, and that would, we say, be the, 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 um, the proper way to do it. If, if there's an issue about, no, this isn't a proper in intrinsic reference case, 
case, then that says that in defence, and then we uh, we deal with it. Uh, uh, um, but both the judge and the respondent seem to think that we're under some kind of duty to provide, a, as the judge says, paragraph 13 of his judgment, a, a, an explanation of the other companies in, in the Dyson group. We, we simply don't understand that. It's, it's, we're not bringing a claim on behalf of all the companies in the Dyson group. We're not explaining how that group operates. We're approaching this from the perspective of the ordinary reasonable reader. And one thing you can be certain of, I think beyond any sensible doubt, is that the ordinary reasonable reader have no idea of the structure of the Dyson group. When they watch this Channel 4, they're not you know, flicking through the internet looking to work out which companies are, are parents and which are subsidiaries and which trade where and how the whole group operates. They're just thinking, Dyson, this is appalling. Look at what they're doing. Well, they're told, aren't they, in the broadcast that the company is, uh, to put it broad, uh, bluntly, offshored uh, 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 its operations to Singapore sometime before. Yes. Um, and ordinary people know why that sort of thing is done and um, might suppose that it would involve the setting up of other corporate vehicles. Yes. Uh, and, and, but, but, but on the other hand, they're also told it's a British company, which, of course, it is, and, 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 and it's you know, known as, a, as, as an iconic British firm, company, whatever you put it. Uh, uh, um, so, so we don't accept that we should have uh, 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 um, pleaded uh, uh, um, some uh, details as to as to what the um, the structure of the um, uh, of the company was, uh, and we don't accept that we should somehow plead a group libel case. The, 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 as the as the court will will know, the, the and, and Nutfa is is the is the leading authority in this jurisdiction, and and. and the, the various members of the Judicial Committee make it absolutely plain that there's no special rule about group libels. It, the, the, the question simply is, 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 the, is, is, the, um, is the claimant the person that the publication is referring to? And, and obviously, if the publication is of a, of a large group, it's much more difficult for a claimant to establish that they're the, being referred to. And, and in, in Dutfer, that there were something like 2,000 members of the uh, uh, of the um, Mlado Rus group. And, and, and as, as the members of the House of Lords make it clear, that there's no specific reference to England at all. So as, as my Lord made, made the point, although the witnesses might have said, well, I thought that was about Mr. Nupfer, uh, there's no basis in the publication for, for, for taking that view. It, 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 he wasn't <coughs> mentioned and England wasn't mentioned. Uh, and and you know, the, the classic, the classic example, as everybody knows, you know, all lawyers are thieves, doesn't refer to any particular lawyer. But 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 the size of the size of the group doesn't matter. As the the the, the example given by Lord Porter in in um, in Nupfer at page 124, where he says, "To imagine being a a body where it's said that the only way you can become a member is to have committed a murder." Uh, um, if if that was said, then 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 every member of the uh, of, of the body, however large, could bring a claim for libel because it would be said that each of them had committed a murder. It, 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 it's it's fact specific, of course, but it doesn't it doesn't require any special pleading. Um, and 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 we we um, we say that our case is 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 correctly and properly pleaded and, and, and if there's any, as I say, any issue it should be taken up on the pleadings in the usual way. Can I just ask you about that point because we know that in this sort of slightly unusual procedure that was adopted the defendants then did plead um, in paragraph 14 of the judgment um, what they say they deny that it referred to the second and third claimants. Yes well it's not a, as, as you as you Lordship knows it's not it's not a pleading it's no. it's, it's a it's a it's a strange it, it, uh, um, very useful but sort of intermediate document that's being that the practice probably my lord was responsible for starting it but uh, the practice I mean, I was. <laughs> of ordering ordering a, a, a an advanced statement of a case so that people knew what was going on at the 
the hearing of the preliminary issue trial. Yeah, but yes, I mean, just to remove any, any obscurity about this, the point is that once you put in a defence, the statutory offer of amends is not available to you, and so this is a manoeuvre to let people get issues resolved before the defence goes in, and that opportunity is lost. Y yes, yes, I, 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 I think everybody understands think that, that <laughs> that's what it's about. But, and, and, and for years, the, 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 as the court will know, in the, in the old days, when, when uh, um, in general, uh, um, you couldn't have issues of meaning tried by judges, uh, uh, um, a meaning was was hotly contested. You, there was there was a great block to uh, 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 early uh, uh, resolution of libel cases. And post the Defamation Act 2013, when juries became vanishingly rare, or perhaps they've just vanished, uh, uh, um, that the position was that you could have preliminary issue trials on meaning. And as my lord says, that 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 uh, um, that, that would then give the defendant the opportunity of relying on the offer of amends procedure. But I'm so sorry. The, 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 um, the, your lordship is right that at paragraph 14 it sets out what the what the um, uh, um, defendants say, uh, um, and, and as I say, had they pleaded that on, on reference, we would have responded. Uh, 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 and indeed, uh, um, we, we responded in, in in argument, but obviously we didn't respond as a matter of fact because. Question hasn't arisen yet. Your paragraph 7a and 7b postdated that informal um, document. No, no, they predated it. But, right. but they, they, what, 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 as I say, the, the sequence of events is: parties agree, standard primary issues, judge raises reference. The the the, the defendants then also. Take, take up the baton, as it were. We then plead extrinsic reference as an alternative case. Then this document on 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 um, a statement of case on preliminary issues is served. Thank you. So, my lord, my lord, we say we say that the judge applied the wrong test, uh, 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 um, uh, and. Um, the test he applied was 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 one of of, of targeting and, and, and direction and, and without taking the crucial element into account. Uh, uh, um, we criticise his use of language, but Ross, I want to make two two points, if I may. The, 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 the first is, of course, we accept that the judge. We're not criticising the judge for using targeting in a subjective sense. The, the, the judge knows, and we all know, that, that uh, the subjective question is not relevant here. The question of who the defend, who the respondents actually intended to refer to, it, it doesn't matter. Although in practice, of course, we know who they intended to refer to, namely these these claimants. But that doesn't matter for these purposes. Uh, um, secondly. Uh, um, we accept that, in one sense, as I said to my lord earlier, uh, uh, um, asking the question of the subject or the target of the broadcast it is part of the proper exercise of asking what a reasonable viewer would think. A reasonable viewer think, who, what, what's this about? Who, who are they talking about? Uh, 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 um, but there's an obvious danger here of posing it, focusing on targeting or direction and we say a danger which the a trap which the judge fell into is that you start over analyzing the broadcast you start looking well what can this really be about and, and, and that's what we say what the judge did in the next part of his uh, uh, um, judgment and, and, and it's perhaps worth just uh, uh, um, that's a paragraph we, what we criticize paragraph 52 um, it's perhaps just worth looking briefly at, at, a, at a recent case about broadcast. I know that these were extremely familiar to several members of the court, but it, it's perhaps just worth turning it up because it's just a helpful gathering of the cases together by, by uh, Mr Justice Haddon Cave, as he, as he then was, uh, um, ta uh, authorities uh, um, 16, 
the case of um, Shakil Rahman and ARY Network. And, and this is a, which incidentally Mr. Nicklin, who then was appeared for the claimant. Uh, um, uh, this was a case that was cited to the judge but not mentioned in his judgment. Uh, uh, um, and what, what um, the judge did, Mr. Justice Haddon Cave did in that case, starting at page 290 of the authorities volume, he, he looks specifically at the question of broadcast. Because a broadcast is a slightly different creature, obviously, to a written text. We, we, the, 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 most of the viewers impacted by most of the people on which this impacted were not people who read it. They were people who uh, um, saw it on the television. And he, he, um, he, he I'm not going to, I, I'm not going to read it read it all out but it's it's important that, that the that the position is that the um, the court approaches it on the basis that the reasonable viewer it's helpfully summarised at 22 from a judgment of Mr Justice Eady in an earlier case that that, that it's a matter of impression, very well known principle. Must not be over analytical, subject to leisure or le leisurely or legalistic breakdown, overall flavour, contribution interpretation. Not necessarily be found when subjecting the text to piecemeal analysis. Uh, um, risk that such an exercise will focus on the trees and miss the wood. Uh, 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 and I say a certain a certain degree of loose thinking as it's sometimes called is, is attributed to a viewer in in those um, circumstances uh, of course the judge is very well aware of these principles he's, he's, he's dealt with them in, 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 in numerous cases but uh, um, he, he doesn't there's no reference to them being applied in the meaning context in the part, the part of the judgment where he deals with his decision, uh, uh, and we say that he he um, he adopts a too legalistic analysis of the uh, of the text of the broadcast. That what, what I'm um, trying to ascertain in reading this again is how the judge moved from the propositions in fifty two in which he was analysing the key messages of the broadcast to the conclusion that um, those key messages were not about these companies. Because he, he, he analyses, uh, let's, let's assume correctly for the time being, that the key target is the Dyson company that has the agreement with and therefore oversight of ATA, that's 52.3. And at 52.4 there's a further Dyson company um, which is the target of statements about the PR operation. Maybe the same company. So he's got different different messages. Yes. Um, but then uh, I think in fifty three and fifty four he concludes that those companies are not second and third claimants. Um, well, no, I think uh, put it put I'm it. Just, <laughs> well, putting it fairly, he 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 he. he Concludes that it hasn't been established that they're the first and second claimants. Yes. He, 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 he accepts that it might be the first and second claimants. I think it's fair to put it that way. He, he, but Depending on the ultimate factual situation. He, yes. Yes. Uh, so, 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 so if we were to. Uh, so there's nothing in the broadcast. Because there, is it because they're not named specifically? Is that what he's saying? That, that as in um, Palace Films, the corporate. Full corporate names are not used, therefore it's a it's an extrinsic reference case, um, and they've got to make out their case on the facts. Is that what he said? Yes, and and, and uh, one assumes uh, um, going this this far to be fair to the judge. If in paragraph two of the particulars of claim we had pleaded that uh, um, the second claimant had contracts with AT. AT 
ATA, and the third claimant was responsible for the PR operation. Uh, it, it may be that he would have thought that that was enough. Uh, and, and, and he's saying to us, go back and go back and plead a factual case as to why you fit in with this analysis, is what he's saying to us. Yes. Uh, and and the, the, the missing element, you say, is the assumption that the uh, reasonable reader knows enough about the claimant company to, to, to make them identifiable. Yes, the miss well the missing he doesn't ask that's himself the, that question. ingredient that he misses out. He doesn't ask himself that question at all. But had he and and, and, and uh, Lord, I, I made this point at the outset, I make it again now without apology. Had had he had he said there's repeated reference in the broadcast to British companies. So so I can I can take it that British companies are being uh, uh, um, criticized in the in the broadcast. These are British companies. Then, w would a reasonable reader acquainted with them think that they were the subject target of the broadcast? He doesn't ask any of that. So he he, he sits back. He analyzes. He, he analyzes the broadcast, and and and, and, and I, I'm not I, I'm not engaging with the fine detail of that that, that analysis. It's a, it's a it's a perfectly as one might expect, a perfectly sensible and credible analysis. But we say it's just not what the reasonable viewer would do. The reasonable viewer is watching this programme, and I know your lordships have seen it. You, you, there's sort of horrible scenes of people describing how they've been tortured, and then there's, there's, there's lawyers saying how appalling this is. And, uh, 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 and, and you know, there's Sir James Dyson at the head of the programme testing out a vacuum cleaner in a store, and, and, and the reader is is thinking increasingly, what a dreadful lot they are. What are these Dyson, what are these Dyson companies up to? How appalling. And, 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 and British Dyson companies. Some of the Lords, I, I say that had he, had he taken that approach, uh, um, it, it would have uh, um, led him to the conclusion we say he should have reached. And, and, and it's interesting, in, in, in paragraph 53, he says, uh, 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 um, depending on the ultimate factual situation, one Dyson company could have a claim based on some form of the claimant's first two meanings, and the further company based on, uh, further on the third. So he's he's basically saying it all depends on the ultimate factual situation. Uh, 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 and, and we say that's just the wrong way around. It's not the, the ultimate factual situation doesn't matter. It's what readers under what viewers understand the factual reasonably understand the factual situation to be. Uh, um, the 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 respondents say, "Oh well, this is all just a finding of fact, and so the court shouldn't lightly interfere." Well. Well, Lord, I, I don't think I need to spend too much time on this. <laughs> the, we, we say, of course, that doesn't apply if there's an error of law. We say there is an error of law, so this court can interfere. And, and, and your lordships will be familiar with what, what um, Lord Kerr says in Stocker, which is referred to by my friends. Where in, in Stocker was a case where. The judge had made an erroneous decision on meaning. He'd applied the wrong test, uh, um, so the, the Supreme Court were entitled to interfere with it. But in any event, uh, uh, um, Lord Lord Kerr said it, it was a situation which called for disciplined restraint, uh, um, and, and that epithets such as plainly or quite satisfied it was wrong were not appropriate. That's paragraph fifty-nine. So, so well, Lord. As, as the court knows, you don't need me to say this. If, if an error of law is identified, as I hope I have done, then uh, um, the court can interfere with those findings made by the judge. Uh, um, so, my lords, we, we say that, that really this is a, a straightforward matter. That the, that the in analysing this question of reference, the judge was wrongly focusing 
on, on wrongly concerning himself with the corporate structure, with what the companies were actually doing, rather than the impression that would have been made by on reasonable viewers by the programme. Those viewers would have understood the criticism being about British companies and their failures to properly protect the Malaysian workers. Uh, the, the, um, the reasonable viewer wouldn't be concerned about exactly how the structure worked or, or who would enter the, into contracts with who. But, but really that here was a British company that held itself out as a model uh, and was actually complicit in the mistreatment of work. And, and um, the, those the claimants are the. Well, meaning hasn't been established yet, and I know that's your pleaded meaning. But the defendants have different pleaded meanings. But, Better but, that we just stick with identification. At the moment. But, 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 my lord, my lord, of course, your your lordship's right, and the, the, the judge, the, the judge um, refused my uh, uh, suggestion that he should, in, in any event, determine meaning. Uh, uh, um, so, so meaning has not yet been determined, and, and no, your lordship is completely right, and I, that's my case. Uh, uh, um, but for for the moment, uh, uh, um, as, as your lordship says, we're dealing only with ref. Thank you. Uh, um, so, put shortly, my lords, your lordships will have seen the order we seek. The, 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 in our notice of appeal, that the uh, uh, um, that this court should. Uh, uh, um, Find that the should order that the um, record the finding that based solely on intrinsic evidence, the broadcast refers to the uh, uh, the second and third claimants. And that would leave it open to the judge deciding meaning to find some, but not all, of the imputations or categories of imputation that are in dispute apply to one of the claimants and not the other. Uh, um, I mean the PR imputation, if I can put it that, might apply to one of the claimants and not the other. Yes, yes. That's uh, um, uh, everything is the right outcome. I'm just saying that. Yes, everything we, is left. We have to leave that. Yes. Open. Everything is left open, and and and, and, and as I say, it, it, it also it, it also leaves open the the the, uh, um, the defence can raise whatever issues the defence wishes to raise about. But, but, but the, 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 if, if the, 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 all the court can do at the moment is proceed on the basis of the, uh, of the particulars of claim. Yes, yeah, so it's a preliminary to another possible preliminary. Well, <laughs> uh, um, we are where we are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we, 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 we but, but the, 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 the you lordships will have seen that not only did the judge uh, uh, say that there was, this wasn't a, uh, uh, um, proper intrinsic reference case, he also said, ah, struck out our extrinsic reference case for good measure. Uh, um, and and uh, well, as we say, we should be, uh, the court should find the judge was wrong to do that. So paragraph two of his order on page 76, you, you ask us to revisit as well then? I'm so sorry. Well, we haven't we haven't raised that in our notice of appeal. And of course, if the if the intrinsic reference case is good, then we don't need an extrinsic reference case. Uh, um, and, and that that strikeout was made, uh, if I can put it this way, of the judge's own motion. There wasn't an application to strike those paragraphs out. No, you're, you're not appealing against that part of the order. No. no. A good, very good way of putting it. Make things more simple. Well, also, unless I can assist your lordships further. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs> Mr. Wallace. Um, I'm going to address uh, three different topics. First of all, uh, and say a little bit about the factual case advanced by the claimant on reference. Uh, secondly, some submissions on the applicable legal principles, with a particular focus on what I think is probably a very narrow dispute. Because the legal principles are largely not an issue. 
Uh, and then finally, I'm going to say something about the grounds of appeal. Thank you. Um, can I start, please, with the particulars of claim, which are at tab nine of the main document? Um, <coughs> it, it's important to start with the claimant's pleaded case on reference, as it was before the judge. Um, paragraph one deals with the first claimant, but it says something about um, the company Dyson, or rather the brand. First claimant is the founder and chairman of Dyson, the multinational technology enterprise established in 1991. His name is synonymous with the Dyson brand and group of companies. So we learn from that that uh, there is a brand and there is a group of companies. And that it is a multinational technology enterprise. So the international uh, characteristic of Dyson uh, is part of the claimant's own pleaded case um, about the group. Paragraph two, the second claimant is the UK-based company within the Dyson Group that holds Dyson's intellectual property, technology, and brand rights. The second claimant employs a number of Dyson's executive team and retains Dyson uh, advisors to protect the reputation of Dyson. So it's not saying it actually does the PR; it retains. Uh, advisors to protect the reputation of Dyson. And then all that's said about the third claimant is the third claimant is Dyson's UK trading company. Now that's it in terms of the pleaded case on intrinsic reference in the particulars of claim. Um, as you may have seen from the judgment, that prompted um, the defendant to uh, seek uh, part 18 uh, further information about the case on reference. And the judge makes uh, reference to this in his judgment. Um, can I ask you please to turn to that? Uh, paragraph 8 of the judgment the defendant sought further information about, uh, amongst other things, about the claimant's case that the broadcast had referred to the second and third defendants. And as the judge explains, this is the prompt. This is where this debate about reference all started. It was a um, request made by the defendants for further information. On the 13th of May, the claimants declined to pro provide any further information, saying the information requested is not reasonably necessary to enable the defendants to prepare their own case or to understand the case they have to meet. The claimant's pleaded case is clear, and the defendants are not entitled to any further information. The claimants do not plead a reference in innuendo. Now, of course, that changed over time, but that was the position when the answer came back to the Part 18 response. And then this, the claimants rely upon the content of the words complained of, which it will be contended would be understood by an ordinary reasonable reader of the broadcast, view of the broadcast to refer to the second and third claimants as prominent Dyson companies. So that's the extra bit of information that comes back in response to the Part 18 uh, request. And that's all. It's that they are prominent Dyson companies. So um, nothing is said about the group, about the size of the group, uh, how many companies there are within the group, the structure of the group, so where these claimant companies fit in within that structure, and which uh, company is at the top of that structure, um, or where the various other companies within the structure are in the world. We know it's multinational from the pleading, but we don't know where in the world the rest of the companies are and how many there are. The judge... <coughs> made some observations about this case in paragraph 13, and, and they're important. They're, they're central to the conclusion that the judge ultimately reached uh, on reference. So what he says in paragraph 13 is, it's a point to which I shall return later in this judgment, but the pleaded case as to the Dyson group is somewhat opaque. The, the definition given to Dyson is not of a company, but rather an enterprise or brand. 
whilst the particulars of claim do indicate that there is a corporate group of which the second and third claimants are part, nothing further is said about the group structure or other corporate entities within it. It does not even identify the ultimate company that controls the group. The details provided in the amended particulars of claim take matters only a little further forward. Paragraph 7b1, the second and third claimants are said to be the only companies within the Dyson Group that interact with UK consumers. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment, because that's the case on extrinsic reference. But on intrinsic reference, what the judge was saying is, well, I know next to nothing about this group from the case being advanced by the claimants. Um, and that's obviously important. Um, it's important for a number of reasons. Um, one of them, to address a point made by uh, Mr. Tomlinson towards the end of his submissions, is that if this case is being advanced by the claimant on the basis of a group libel, that this was a, these companies were <laughs> identified along with the rest of the companies within the Dyson Group as being the subject of the broadcast. Well, that is a very difficult case to maintain when the judge is not even being told how big the group is. Because that's obviously a key factor when it comes to when the court comes to look at whether or not all uh, members of any given group are defamed. But we're not told. So immediately, the judge is confronted with a problem which, on the basis of the case he's given in court, is insoluble, which is he can't say whether all the companies within the group are defamed, because he knows nothing about the group. It's simply impossible to reach that kind of conclusion. So the judge makes those points in paragraph um, 13 about the opacity of the claimant's pleaded case um, on extrinsic reference. And of course, the issue the judge was deciding did not concern extrinsic reference. Um, the, the, the case, if we can go back to the uh, pleading, please, at tab 9. The extrinsic reference case at page 117 starts off at 7a by saying the claimant's primary case is that reasonable readers would understand the broadcaster referred to each of the claims without special knowledge of any extrinsic facts. That's the intrinsic case. But then this, in relation to the second and third claimants, if and in so far as necessary, in the alternative, the broadcast was understood by a substantial number of viewers of the broadcast to refer to them. So this is the case that only certain viewers would understand the words to refer to the claimants on the basis of some extrinsic knowledge that they had. And that knowledge is then pleaded uh, at 7b. 7b1, the second and third claimants are the most, most prominent UK companies within the Dyson Group. So whereas we had prominent when it came to intrinsic reference in response to the Part 18 response, now we have the most prominent UK companies within the Dyson Group. They are the only companies within the Dyson Group that interact with UK consumers. B2, the second claimant employs a number of Dyson's executive team and retains advisors <coughs> to protect the reputation of Dyson. Now this time, in the extrinsic reference case, what's being said is that not all, but only some viewers had that knowledge. So that's extrinsic knowledge only known to some viewers. 7b3, the third claimant is Dyson's trading company and makes sales of Dyson products to businesses and consumers in England and Wales. And then s s some other facts. And, and as I say, 7b5, all that's being alleged here is that a proportion of viewers had that special knowledge. So on the claimant's own case, the ordinary reasonable reader did not have that knowledge. Only a section of readers had that knowledge, and that section of readers were not the concern of the judge at this preliminary issue trial, because it was solely concerned with intrinsic reference. So one gets back to the intrinsic reference case, which, as the judge pointed out, was opaque, not to say threadbare. As it happens, the case on uh, reference has evolved even since the case that was before the judge uh, so that what we have within the skeleton argument, if I can please ask you to turn to it, the appellant skeleton argument at uh, bundle page 41, tab 2. Is, 
is a case that is evolved. And it seems this time, it, this is what is said to be the case on intrinsic rather than extrinsic reference. No, no distinction is made, but it would appear to be that this is the case that the claimants are making before the court today on intrinsic reference. And what's said is this. And in fact, in this case, the position is more straightforward as the appellants are by far the most prominent uh, Dyson companies. And this time, it's not UK, it's British Dyson companies. And the only British Dyson companies that interact with British consumers. Now, that is a development of the pleaded case. It's now they're not just the most prominent companies, they're by far the most prominent companies, and they're not UK companies interacting with UK consumers, but it's a narrower band. It's British companies interacting with British consumers. <clears throat> now, the re reason why I, I, I point this out is because it demonstrates the difficulty that was confronted by the judge. The, the judge on intrinsic reference had next to nothing about these particular claimant companies and was therefore deprived of information that might have enabled him to link the allegations in the broadcast with the specific claimants. Confronted with that difficulty, the case has somewhat evolved. The claimant's case has somewhat evolved and indeed continues to evolve today. Uh, and the reason for that, we suggest, is because the claimants can themselves see that the judge had a problem. Uh, and they're, they're trying to keep solving it. But the fact is, the problem that the judge identified is one that made him unable to find that these words related to these specific claimants on intrinsic reference basis. So th that's the starting point. And it, it, in my submission, once the court appreciates the difficulty that the judge had, it, it is readily understandable how it was that he was unable to conclude that the words related to these specific corporate claimants. Indeed, it would have been impossible for him to find that they related to these specific corporation, uh, these specific corporate claimants on the basis of the information he was provided with. Can I just ask there, the information that he's provided with um, is itself properly analysed extrinsic because it didn't come from the broadcast. Uh, absolutely. So how... I mean, I, I well understand that people have analysed in terms of intrinsic, extrinsic, but is it really very helpful? Well, the, the way the judge deals with this is he proceeds in his judgment um, at the beginning on the basis, if one sees this from paragraph two, if you like, on the assumed basis that the claimant's case on intrinsic reference is correct. That, that's the basis on which he approaches the case. Can you really do that on a preliminary issue it can when be. you're try, trying to do that? I mean, it's a mix of strikeout, you're assuming the particulars of claim to be true, uh, and a mix of capability. Can this, is this capable of referring? It, but it's not actually determining anything. Well, it, it's not. Obviously, if, if there were, an, Mr. Tomlinson's right, if we had put in issue those matters, if we had said, well, I, hang on a minute, we don't accept that the, the second claim is a UK-based company within the Dyson group that holds Dyson's IP, etc. third claim is a UK trading company, then it may have, there may have been a problem, and the judge may have been confronted with a situation where he couldn't resolve a dispute of fact. As it happened, this was uncontroversial. It wasn't suggested by the defendant that he could not proceed on the basis that those facts were correct. So, which paragraph of the judge? This is paragraph two. This is paragraph two. Well, yes. But that's just background. It's background. He doesn't make those points in the context of his, his discussion of intrinsic references. Well, he, he doesn't... He doesn't say, well, this is all I'm told, and that's not enough. Well, he, he, he's, he doesn't say that later in the judgment, but plainly that's what he has in mind, because one looks, um, I've already taken your lordship to it, but to paragraph 13. That, that's the key. That's the key problem that he identifies that he has when it comes to reference, <coughs> is, the, is the paucity of information that he is being provided with. And that, that if you like, percolate, permeates his, his, his decision. We'll, we'll, we'll come to what he says later in due course, but that, that, that is obviously the... the 
the starting point, and it is the key feature of the case as he sees it, we say correctly. Um, so he, he, as I say, that, 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 is the, that is the fundamental problem, and it's a problem which is of the claimant's own creation, because it would have been open for the claimants to um, advance um, a much more detailed uh, case on reference. Now, it might have been, um, my Lord, Lord Justice Dingman makes the point, it might have been that that then gave rise to issues of fact which make this unsuitable for a preliminary determination. Um, and we accept that had that been the case, had a much more granular case been advanced, then we might be in a very different situation. Then maybe there couldn't have been a trial. As it happens, the case was so thin that was advanced and there was no evidence put before the judge, and the claimants initially said they would put in evidence and then changed their mind, decided not to, that the judge was able to proceed on, on the basis of, of the case that was put before him, because it was just so minimal. That, that, was, that was something he was able to do. Um, so so that's, the, that's the case that's being advanced. Now, my learning friend says, well, in a group libel case, it's not necessary to plead more information about a claimant, um, about the group of which the claimant is a part. But the point we make is, well, it might not be strictly necessary. There's no rule saying you have to do it. There's no principle that you have to do it. But if you don't do it, then, you, then that's at your peril, because you then deprive the judge of the information that he or she needs in order to make a finding in your favor, um, particularly when, as here, you say enough in your pleading to indicate that this is a multinational brand, which obviously has global reach and is of some complexity. <clears throat> um, so that's the that's the the factual case. Um, legal principles. Can I just ask you something on the factual case? Yes. If you're le leaving it, they did plead at paragraph two at the end. The third claimant is Dyson's UK trading company. Um, the Mr. Tomlinson has said that the broadcast refers to a uh, iconic British company and flagship company in Britain, and we do know that one of the um, pieces in the broadcast was filmed outside a store which said Dyson. Um, if this is to be taken as true for these purposes, that the third claimant is the Dyson's UK trading company, then who else could it be referring to? Oh, well, th on that, 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 this is obviously a question of fact, but what the judge does, and again, we, we'll uh, 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 we can turn to it in more detail at the end when we're looking at the errors that he's saying, saying um, to have um, uh, committed, but he's, what he does is he looks at the broadcast and he says, well, okay, uh, where, is, where are these events happening that are described in the broadcast? So it might be a UK, this is a, a factual point, it might be, it might be a British company, uh, Dyson might be, there may be a British company involved, but the matters that are described in the broadcast, where is the company which is doing those things? And the broadcast concerns very much an internet, it's an international picture that's presented. Um, my Lord, Lord Justice Warby has, has referred to the fact it's, it's offshored, um, there is the um, Michelle Shi, who's the spokeswoman, who is based in Malaysia. She's gone out of bed at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, we've seen that. And, and all, all of those points, which point away from the UK. Um, what, as what, being... what about the proposition, which comes over quite strongly in in the broadcast, and maybe entirely justifiable, capable, honest opinion, or all the rest of it, which is you're selling products sourced, albeit from the Far East where the workers are being abused. You've been told about it and you're doing nothing about it, which appears to relate to what's happening here rather than the genesis of it, which was in Malaysia. Yes, so so on that, and again, I'm going to address your lordships perhaps in a, in a little more detail on this in due course, but... Well, it, it's, you said you'd finish the facts. That's the only reason it, I asked, sorry. So so, so the, the, the point here is, and this is, this is obviously key to understanding the judge's judgment, is... What is the judgment? What is the broadcast actually alleging? What is the key? What are the key messages of the of the broadcast? And the judge identifies what those key messages are. And I don't think an issue is taken with that by uh, by the appellants. And then he, and, and the key messages, as he says, are divided into two. Um, one is well, the re it concerns 
what is going on with this company, the oversight of this company in Malaysia, the supplier company in Malaysia. And therefore, the target is the company that has that relationship with the company in Malaysia, with the supplier company in Malaysia. So that's the first point. The second point is the, 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 the PR point. The first point is obviously the major one. And the point the judge makes, and this is key to understanding his, his conclusion as well, that what the, the broadcast is, what it concerns, the key message of the broadcast is, what is the company that has that relationship with the supplier in Malaysia doing wrong? That's what, that, that, that's, that's what the broadcast concerns. It doesn't concern what a com the company that's selling vacuum cleaners. That's, that's a different, it's not saying, for example, well, consumers are being misled about what the vacuum cleaners are like or they're being ripped off or anything like that. It's about what's going on between the supplier company and whichever Dyson company it is that has the relationship with the supplier company. That is the target of the broadcast. So the question for the judge is, well, which company is that within this group that I'm being told exists, this international brand, international group? Which, which is that company that has the relationship with, with, the, uh, with the Malaysian supplier company? Answer, I don't know, because I'm not told. The claimants are just not giving me that information. But the difficulty with that argument might be that the broadcast focuses very heavily on the iconic brand, the British company, uh, the view has been told it's a British company whose reputation is being tarnished by this, these revelations. So um, the pleaded case may not tell you, but why does it need to? The question is what the broadcast says. Well, the, the, the broadcast mentions British, British brand, British company, but the, 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 the judge's finding was that the real focus of the broadcast was on that relationship. And that relationship concerns events in Malaysia, because it's yes, all about. But the broadcast didn't say, this is a huge international company, a group with many companies. We don't know. Well, there may be some company in uh, Singapore that's running this operation. Also, didn't say, well, there is, or this might be. They just said, British company, and it's responsible, it's being sued. Well, we'll have a look at that. But it doesn't say the British company was being sued. It doesn't, no, it doesn't, explicit, it, it doesn't explicitly say that. It, it says Dyson is being sued. It, it calls Dyson an iconic British company. It, there is there is reference to Dyson as a, a, a there is reference to a, a British company, but it's a long broadcast, mm. and the judge's finding, having watched the broadcast and having obviously read the transcript several times, is well the real focus here isn't on a British company, it's on whichever company it is that has the relationship with the, with the supplier in Malaysia, wherever that is. And I, I don't know where that is. That, that's, the, that's, the key, that's the key conclusion of the judge on, on the facts. And, and as I say, what's is, not been... Is that a factual finding? Because I, I thought there were no facts in this one. And what he was asked to do, but perfectly understandably didn't, because he hadn't gone on to decide meaning. He didn't decide meaning because there was no one to whom a reference could be made. No, no, he didn't decide meaning, but part of the exercise of deciding reference is to look at what the target of the allegations is. That's, that's, um, we'll, we'll look at that in a moment, but that's on the authority. It's plainly something the judge, judge should do. Um, so that, that's what he was doing. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's similar to deciding meaning, but obviously mm -hmm. it's not the same as deciding meaning. Thank you. Sorry, I interrupted you as you'd left the facts and you were about to start the legal principles. Yeah, th th there is in fact very little between us on the, um, on the legal principles. The judge remarked on that um, in his judgment. Um, parties are agreed that the test is the same uh, for intrinsic and extrinsic reference cases. Uh, so in every case, the court um, must assess reference objectively, applying the principles um, used to determine meaning. Um, the Parties are also agreed that in cases of group libel, the exercise of determining um, reference requires the court to consider a variety of different factors. And these are probably best summarized in uh, Boo Malhab. That's the case uh, from the Supreme Court in um, Canada. But there are a variety of different, different factors that come into play. Uh, and one of those factors is uh, 
is uh, well, what was the subject of the allegations? What was the what was which claimant was the subject of the allegations? And that involves looking at the message of the words. And that's not in contention between us. Um, my learned friend Skeleton, paragraph fifty-five, uh, makes it clear that, that that he doesn't take issue with that as being one of the factors that needs to be uh, looked at by the court. Um, it's also not in dispute on this appeal that the fact an article is likely to cause harm to a claimant does not mean that the claimant has a cause of action in defamation. Uh, the judge gave an example at paragraph 29 from uh, the Sungrave case. Um, again, that's, that's not, not controversial. Um, so, um, it, we say in this case... Um, Dyson as a brand, an international brand, um, is in a similar position uh, to, um, the, the, the case is quite similar in many ways to the Sungrave case which the, ju which the judge cites. So that's a case in which um, the suggestion is that a, an allegation that says a car is unsafe may harm distributors in their pocket but wouldn't give them a cause of action in libel. And we, we say this is a, a similar situation, the, the fact that uh, allegations are being made about the way the company operates vis-a-vis -vis its suppliers in Malaysia does not mean that these companies necessarily have um, a claim. And, and that, I, I think, is uncontroversial. Um, points of difference between us um, are perhaps subtle. Um, Palace Films comes in for some criticism by my learned friend. Um, he, he contends that the judge fell into error in deriving guidance from that case. Um, we're not sure how far this, this really gets the claimant, the, 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 the assault on Palace Films, because the key principle applied in Palace Films um, is really the same as the principle that was applied in, in the Elite case. Um, and that case, the claimants don't say, was wrongly decided. Um, so. Um, it's perhaps a slightly arid dispute <laughs> whether Palace Films was, was rightly or wrongly decided. Nevertheless, uh, we say the criticisms made of that decision are misplaced. Um, it was, of course, a decision by Judge McCullum, who was um, not just in charge of the defamation list in the New South Wales Supreme Court, um, but is now the Chief Justice of the Australian Capital Territory. Um, so a judge steeped in this area of law um, that was a case in which, um, as we've seen, the article that we don't we don't have the words complained of, so we don't know exactly what what the um, what the words were in Palace Films. But we can see from the judgment the, uh, that they talked about Palace Films, uh, and they made clear that Palace Films carried out film distribution in Australia, uh, and the company which carried out the business of film distribution in Australia was in fact not. The claimant was not Palace Films PTY, but was a different company uh, that could not sue for libel. Um, so the, the assumption made by the judge in that case is that the, is that the reasonable reader or viewer uh, would not have, uh, would have known that Palace Films, in fact, uh, is not a company that, that does film distribution. That's, that, that, that lies, you know, that's implicit in the judgment. Um, we say, well, that's fair enough. And it was a perfectly reasonable uh, conclusion for that judge to reach on those facts. Obviously, we don't know exactly what the facts were, but that plainly is the, the judge, the conclusion that she reached. Now, what's said by my learned friend is that the, the judgment in that case was wrong because, first of all, the judge got confused between um, the use of a name and identification of the claimant. Uh, what's said is that, that the judge got muddled up between the two uh, concepts. Now, can, can I ask you please to look at the, uh, look at the case? It's at tab 33. Um, there are 
instances where the judge uses the word named, but my submission is it's quite obvious that what she meant was identified. She, she uses the two terms interchangeably, and that's, that's plain because otherwise uh, one sees that the, the judgment just doesn't make any sense. So, for example, paragraph 11 at page 840. The parties were in dispute as to whether the first payment, uh, plaintiff is named in the article. Nowhere in the articles is there reference to Palace Films PTY. Well, plainly that means identified. It can't mean named because there can't be a dispute as to whether or not Palace Films is named, only as to whether it's identified. Um, similarly, paragraph 12. Um, the, they contended at the top of page 841 that by reason of omission of the corporate characteristics PTY limited, the first plaintiff was not named. Well, again, that, that submission makes no sense if what is meant is named rather than identified. Um, Sorry, which paragraph is that? Uh, that's paragraph 12, yeah. and that's about three lines down, top of page 841. Yeah, thank you. Paragraph 16, <coughs> page 842, the threshold question is whether reference to Palace Films without the full corporate title adequately named the first plaintiff. Again, that can only mean identified. You can't mean named as in given the name because you don't have an adequate naming. It's a binary question. So obviously what was meant was um, identified. Uh, and then finally, paragraph um, paragraph 21, the word named is not used, but here she uses identified. So accordingly, I'm satisfied in order to maintain the claims necessary for the first plaintiff to establish it was identified by readers with knowledge of extrinsic facts. So there she uses the word identified. But what's apparent from those preceding paragraphs and that one taken together is that the two words were used interchangeably. Well, so there's... Yes, she is. She's not using naming and identification synonymously. She's accepting that naming is one way of identifying. The other is extrinsic uh, Which is correct. Yeah. That, that's correct. So it, it, that well, paragraph makes... judge is making those paragraphs we've just seen is that she has to she has to answer the question was this specific cor corporation corporate claimant identified that that's the question that she she she's being asked to she she, she has to address um, and the point we make is the fact that she um, characterizes that question as one of naming rather than identification doesn't mean she's asking the wrong question she's asking the right question She's describing it in a way which is perhaps apt to confuse, but it's, it's still the right question. Um, and the means by which she gets to the answer, we say in paragraph 20, is conventional. It's that there's, nothing, there's nothing controversial about it. So what she says in paragraph 20 is that, um, th th this is 
line four, the reference to Palace Films does not indicate that the entity referred to as a company. Well, that obviously means a specific company. It doesn't mean it. Obviously, it doesn't mean it refers to a person, individual person. This is significant in the context that, as already explained, it's clear enough that the articles were concerned with the business, in fact, conducted by Palace Enterprises Pty trading as Palace Films. So there, what she's doing is she's saying, you look at the message, you look at what the articles were concerned with, and, and the answer is film distribution. And it's clear that that is not a business with which this claimant is concerned. That's not the business of the first claimant. That, that we say is conventional. That, that, that's a, a unsurprising conclusion to reach <clears throat> in that case. That, that, that there's nothing controversial about it. She's doing exactly the exercise she needs to do, which is looking at the allegations, namely they concern the business of film distribution, looking at what the, the, the corporate claimant does, which is not film distribution, saying, well, the words simply can't refer to the corporate claimant. So we say that the, the decision is is correct, um, and the, the means by which my learned friend seems to say it's, it's, it's arrived at by um, application of the wrong principles um, don't withstand scrutiny. What about Mr. Tom Tomlinson's second point, which was that the judge was wrong to suggest, almost inferentially, that you could only have one proper person, i.e. the film distributor, because you could name someone who is not, in fact, a film distributor, who suffers terrible loss because of this, because everyone misunderstands them to be the subject of the life. Yes, it, it, there may be a case where that <coughs> happens, but evidently the judge in this case decided that was not the, the, yeah. the situation. It, it, it comes down to the facts. Um, we don't know precisely what the facts were, but there, there, may, be a, there may be a case where that, where that happens. Um, but, um, but, but this wasn't one, and we say... Um, I don't think it's suggested that the current case is, is, is such a case, not a case of misidentification, I think that's the way it's put. Um, so the, it's, it's also suggested, I, I'm not sure this is still being uh, advanced as a criticism of Palace, but it's suggested in the skeleton argument, one of the skeleton argument, that Palace was wrong because readers acquainted with the claimant must have known uh, that the claimant um, did not trade and has never traded. Uh, and I think it was um, um, my Lord, Lord Justice Warby who drew a contrast with the Undry case. Plainly, the judge in Palace reaches a different conclusion from um, the conclusion reached in Undry. In Undry, uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Warby found that a reasonable reader would have known that at the relevant time the particular corporate entity was not trading at the, at the, at the time of the events described in the press release. Um, whereas in Palace, uh, the judge concluded that was not the case, that a reasonable reader would not have known that that particular company was trading. And that is a question of fact for the judge. Uh, Undry was a, a, a case in which um, the, the companies concerned were very, very small. All they did is um, run a, a vegan restaurant. There was, there was a Claimant company was a successor company to another company. They were very small. Uh, so the decision in that case was that the reasonable reader acquainted with the claimant, uh, well, that's going to be a very small class, they would have known that that company only came to existence at a certain time. In Palace Films, evidently, the judge reached a different conclusion. These are all matters of fact for the, for the, for the judge deciding the issue of intrinsic reference. So um, we say that um, that criticism of the judgment is um, misplaced. Um, the other uh, matter which my learned friend says um, is wrong in, um, in uh, Palace, or rather that Mr. Justice Nicklin was wrong to derive from Palace, was that it demonstrates the strictness, is the word used, of the principles that company, uh, companies must um, establish themselves as the subject of allegations. Now, um, strictness means no more that in a corporate context it's necessary for the claimant to show that it was the company that was identified. And that can be difficult it, where there's a complex group structure in particular. Uh, Mr. Fensky, sorry. The, the, you've said it a number of times. You, you've said it, it, it's necessary to show that it was the company that was identified. But uh, what I... That, that's, that always seems sounds from where I'm sitting to look as though you're looking at what did the person 
sending it out tended to me, but it's not, is it? No, it's about no, no. what a reasonable reader it is. would think. It is. And a reasonable reader doesn't necessarily have to think like that at all, do they? I mean, I mean, in other words, it doesn't have to be one company that's identified. Whether, whether the, the, the broadcaster could have intended to identify company A, and indeed it could be no doubt that everyone broadcasting it thinks it identifies company A, and in some sense it does. But it could also be one which a reasonable viewer could think identifies company B. It doesn't have to be one answer. No, no, my, my, my lord is right. And, the, and the, the, the question for the judge is, well, what would the reasonable reader conclude? Which, which, what company was identified? That, that's, a, that's a question for the judge. And intention of the broadcaster, of the, of the publisher, is, of course, irrelevant to determination yes. of that. Which is that I, what bothers me is that when you phrase it that way, it sounds as though it's a question which can only ever have one answer. No, no. But, but the, the, the job of the, the, the judge, the fact finder, is well, what what is which is the claimant? Which is the, in this case, company that the reasonable reader would identify as being the subject of the allegation? Why is it that? Why is it, why isn't it the way Mr. Thomson puts it to say? Would a reasonable reader acquainted with the claimant identify it as being that company? It isn't the same thing. Uh, well, that that, that 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 is the right approach. It is. It's. It's. Would a reasonable reader who is an, acquainted with the company I'll, with the claimant I'll come on to in a moment, but would a reasonable reader acquainted with the company, looking at the broadcast, identify it as the subject of the allegations? Mm -hmm. That's the. That, that's the you correct agree approach. That, 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 that is the correct approach. Yeah. Um, so, um, just coming back to the, the point about strictness, th this we say really is no, saying no more um, than what Mr. Justice Tugendhat said in the. Uh, Euro money case. This is a, a, a passage which um, we, um, which the judge uh, refers to at paragraph 61 of his judgment, where he says, perhaps you can refer to it, um, paragraph 61. Uh, sorry, 31, um, page 88, um, where the, what Mr. Justice Tugendhat said in Euromoney is cited, uh, approving what was said in Duncan and Neil on uh, uh, in defamation, where the publication relates to a business with a complex corporate structure, care should be taken to bring the claim in the name of a company which one would be identified by reasonable readers as the subject of the allegations and two apps suffer damage in its own trading reputation. So what is being said there is um, no different from what Mr. Justice Nicklin said in the current case, which is that there is a strictness that needs to be applied to this exercise. Care must be taken to ensure that you get the right corporate claimant in, in the situation where you have a complex corporate structure. Um, we haven't looked at your own money, but the, 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 the bit of that quotation that Come from Mr. Justice Tugendhat rather than from Duncan and Neil. Talks about words disparaging unnamed corporations and identifying the business. So this is the kind of David Jones store where the, the, the corporation is not named, but the business is identified. Are this slightly different situation from what you might describe as family of companies that all have a common name? But a whole range of different Sussex suffixes. Um, so they're all called Dyson, or they're all called David Jones, or, or Palace something. Um, but they're doing different things. Um, that that proposition about care might be applied differently according to the particular circumstances of the case. Well, it, it might, but the the, the point we. Thought, we we say the point is equally applicable to any any corporate libel claim where you have a complex co complex corporate structure, whatever the particular. Equally, like, equally applicable to a family of individuals, I say. Could be. They all have the same surname. Um, the the Walansky family have done evil deeds in East London. Um, you might say it's a, a sort of class libel, um, and there might be something, or there might be nothing in the um, words. Pointed the reader, the viewer, or whatever, in the direction of particular individuals within that family. Um, maybe it's only where they're resident or what they 
do. Um, so there might not be much care needed for this one, <laughs> the nature of the group and the way that the, the, the words refer. But the, the, the point about cor corporate groups that, that the judge is making um, in, um, in Euro money is that there is an element of complexity that arises in the, in the corporate context. That, that, that we suggest is uncontroversial, particularly where it's multinational, like in the current case. <clears throat> so um, Palace Films, um, we say, was, uh, correctly identifies the relevant principles. Uh, the judge was entitled to place reliance on it. But really, the, the, the key point here is that even if you, 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 your lordships disagree with what um, Justice McCullum did in Palace Films, it doesn't matter, because the uh, central <clears throat> point from Palace is not in contention, which is that um, when assessing uh, reference, the court needs to look at um, what the articles were concerned with, so the subject matter of the allegations. Um, the, uh, th that is uh, not a novel principle. It was not established in Palace Films, and it's been applied in other cases too. And what we do in the skeleton argument is we set out a number of cases, uh, older cases, in which uh, it's made clear that the court, when determining reference, needs, amongst other things, to look at the interpretation that's put on words and the circumstances of publication. So those are factors the court needs to take into account. Um, we, uh, I, I don't need to take your lordships to the cases themselves un unless um, you'd find it helpful, but at, at paragraph 45 of the skeleton, we, we summarize them. So we have Lord Justice Farwell in the Court of Appeal in Jones and Hulton, and this is not controversial from Lord Justice um, uh, Farwell's um, judgment in that case, where, uh, and we set this out as I say in the skeleton at paragraph 45, he refers to the interpretation that would reasonably be put on those words by persons who know the plaintiff and the circumstances. Um, and what Lord Justice uh, Farwell said there was uh, concurred with by Lord Atkinson and Lord Gorrell in Jones and Halton in the House of Lords. So um, that, that, that's a correct statement of the law uh, that your lordships will find for your note at the judgment of, of the House of Lords in Jones and Halton, tab 4, at page 25. Um, paragraph 46 of our skeleton, we refer to what Lord Lawburn says in Jones and Halton. Uh, what does the tort consist in? It consists in using language which others knowing the circumstances would reasonably think to be defamatory of the person complaining of and injured by it. That was a passage cited with approval by Lord Morris in, in Morgan in the House of Lords um, at page 1253 E to F. Uh, for your Lordship's note again, that's Bundle of Authorities, page 115. Uh, and Very then. Uh, that is uh, at tab four. Thank you. Nupfer, uh, Lord Porter, it's at tab six, skeleton argument, paragraph 47.2. Uh, Lord Porter in Nupfer says the court needs to consider the generality of the charge and the extravagance of the accusation. So again, looking at the message uh, of the words. Um, and another way in which this same principle has been explained is that the words that the court needs to look at, uh, at, the, at the target of the attack. That's wording that one finds in the Boo Malhab case, which is the case from the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, that uh, is at tab 34. Paragraph 71, page 868. And um, it, this is the judgment in which the Supreme Court of Canada um, set out a, a comprehensive list of the different factors that the court um, 
considers when looking at um, uh, identification, particularly in the context of group libels. So factor four is called the real target of the defamation. So there one sees the word target, which my learned friend criticises from Mr. Justice Nicklin's uh, judgment. In fact, it's, it's, it, this is not new. Uh, that's the word that features in this judgment. And what the judge says um, here, uh, Day, Mr. Justice Deschamps, is the judge must also consider the words, ge gestures, or images used to convey the message in order to determine the real target of the attacks. So it's, it's, it's the point, it, again, it's the same point. You look at what the words are saying in order to determine who, yeah, who they're talking about. You look at the, the message of the words. Uh, I mean, sorry, you, 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 well, I was going to say, what, the, the, what puzzles me about this is it, it seems like the opposite of Holton and Joan. And if I asked that question of Holton and Joan, the answer it was, I forgot, it's Des Artemis, isn't it? Artemis Jones, in, who's a Peckham. Time. I can't remember, but he's got a church job. The church warden. Church warden. There you go. <laughs> That's the target of the attack. But the claimant wasn't a church warden for Peckham. Yes, I mean, that, that brings into play the, 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 uh, something I was going to come on to in a minute, but I'll come on to it now, this, the, 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 the loose thinking. There are cases, Hartman and Jones obviously being um, uh, the best known example, where what happens is there is something in the words that um, points away from the claimant as being, as being the target of the attack. Um, and the point made in Hartman and Jones is, well, um, just because there is something in there that points away from the claimant doesn't mean that the reasonable reader would not identify the words as being words concerning the claimant. So loose thinking, if you like, caters for the situation where there's something wrong. So perhaps. Um, an example from the, the current case would be, let's say the broadcast um, about Dyson. Uh, there were images of um, the reporter not outside a Dyson shop, but outside an Indesit shop. So there was something in the broadcast that rather suggested, it, it, actually, it wasn't Dyson at all that this was about. It was about a completely different brand. Um, well, um, that would not preclude a finding that the words, the real target of the allegations was some Dyson company, quite leaving aside which one and so on. But because, uh, for the same reason as in Hunt and Jones, there were some factual discrepancies, it, it, a reasonable reader might, might well think, well, OK, it's, it's outside an indicit shop, but that can't really be the company that's being discussed because we've heard all about Dyson. Um, so th that's loose thinking. And, and so loose thinking has work to do in a case where there is some discrepancy between, uh, between what's said in the words and the, 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 the claimant. Um, that's not this case. It's, it's not suggested that here there is some, something, some mistake that's being made or there's some error in the broadcast or some, some discrepancy of that nature, which um, needs to be accommodated for by loose thinking. That's not that's not what's being that's not what's being said. Um, so I hope that answers your Lordship's question. Um, uh, so um, th those are the those are the general principles, and the target of the defamation is one of them, um, uh, and um, they come into play with particular um, uh, significance in um, corporate claimant cases, um, we've, we've seen what Mr. Justice um, Tugendhat said in Euro Money. Uh, we've also seen my learned friend took you to it, Gatley uh, 8.002. Um, we also cite that in our skeleton argument at paragraph um, 33. Um, the most recent case where this was looked at in any detail is one which Mr. Justice looked at in the current case, which is elite. And elite is instructive um, because it has um, obvious parallels with the current case. Can I ask your Lordship to take it up? It's at um, tab 13. Sorry, tab 12. Um, this is a... Uh, this 
judgment was um, a judgment on an application um, to strike out a claim at the start of a trial. It was a trial, not a jury trial, it was a trial before Mr Justice Eady. And it, it appears to have proceeded in, um, in several stages. And an application was made at an early point to strike out the claim uh, on the basis that the words could not refer to the specific corporate claimants. Now, uh, we, we don't find from this judgment exactly what the, um, uh, what the words were, or uh, indeed exactly what the broadcast, um, exactly what the broadcast said um, about um, the, the topics. But there is another judgment, which is in tab 11, uh, where that is explained. It's an earlier judgment in the same case. It's at page 183, lines 16 to 26 of the bundle. Mm -hmm. Uh, where what is said is that the programme uh, that was sued over was presented to viewers as the fruits of an undercover investigation into the world of international fashion, particularly in Milan. The claimant corporations, Elite Model Management Corporation, Elite Model Management Limited, and Elite Model Look SA are identified as being companies within the Elite Model Group. This apparently has a large role to play in the provision of fashion models throughout the relevant parts of the world. So that's what this programme was about. Where um, are you reading from? Uh, that, that is the judgment at tab 11, the earlier judgment, yeah, um, at pages at uh, page 183, lines 16 to 26. Sorry. Uh, going back then to the, the main judgment, which is at tab 12, The submission uh, made by the defendants, the overarching submission, was that the words did not defame these particular claimants. Um, the, uh, can I start, please, by um, with paragraph of one, where Mr Justice Eady explains what the key submission is. The defendants argued that the program complained of is not actionable in suit of any of the present claimant companies, in short said that it does not convey any meaning which defames any of them. The allegations reflect on individuals but not on any corporate entity. And then we have the claimant's key submission uh, described at paragraph four, and last four lines in particular, thus they that the claimants contend that it's artificial to draw a distinction between the various corporate entities which comprise that group. Such an argument cannot be pressed too far, on the other hand, since the law requires that any claimant choosing to sue for libel must establish reference. Uh, and essentially, it's the same submission that, that was made by the claimant in the current case, which is that these the distinction can't really be drawn between the different corporate entities, uh, and that readers would understand the words to refer to the whole lot. That's the, it's essentially, essentially the same submission. I, I'm, I'm not sure that's an entirely fair characterization of their case. Their case is these were the two British companies that dealt with consumers over here. They didn't ever say that you could add the rest of the Dyson Group, however big and however small it was. Well, I, 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 I'm not sure that's entirely right. The, the, the case, as we understand it, that, that certainly the case is, as described now, uh, that the, the appellants are advancing, is that this would have been understood to, uh, to, to identify the entirety of the group. No. It's never been understood. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Well, if, so, maybe you don't have to deal with that bit. It, it, but very, tell us what this says. But, but very well. So um, that's that's paragraph four. The different um, the, the the functions of the different uh, claimant companies are described at paragraph eight. So what the judge here does is he explains what each of these corporate claimants does, the the role it carries out within the uh, within the corporate group. Uh, and what you'll note is that each of these companies performed a different function uh, and uh, in a different place. They all had um, different, different roles. And then paragraph nine, four lines from the bottom, uh, what the judge says is the issue is whether any reasonable viewer 
would understand the program to re reflect adversely on the reputation of any company or companies within the group, whether, in other words, the allegation, the allegation was such as to refer to some corporate act or omission on the part of one or more companies, as opposed to merely reflecting upon the individual's concerns. So the important point for current purposes is that the judge said you have to look at what the allegation, uh, the allegation being made was in order to conduct that exercise. Uh, we have at the top of paragraph 10 the point that, uh, as I say, it's uncontentious uh, and was cited by Mr Justice Nicholl in the current case, that it's a non sequitur for the claimants to say, well, we suffered losses and therefore we're referred to. That, 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 that obviously is wrong. Um, paragraph um, 11 is the evidence that um, the claimant put forward on this issue, because as I say, this was, this was a trial. And um, the evidence um, explained what it was that, um, in the claimant's case, the way in which these different legal entities were seen. Then at paragraph 16, uh, the judge says this, it's necessary for me to focus upon the claimant's pleaded meanings. These are to be found in paragraph 5 of the particulars of claim. And he sets out what the, the, what the meanings were. So this is the message of the broadcast. <coughs> and paragraph 17, Mr. Brown submits on behalf of the defendant, the allegations in the program therefore may be conveniently divided into two categories. First, there are the allegations relating to the PR. Secondly, there are those relating to exploitation by senior executives and other employees. So that, again, it's the same exercise that Mr. Justice Nicklin carried out in the current case. 18, addressing for the moment the PR's aspect of the case, it seems to me that the first and second claimants are, in the light of the evidence at this stage of the case, potentially mother agencies, identifiable to some viewers as having omitted to protect the girls for which they are at least uh, in part responsible while in Milan. Um, I shall return to particular aspects of that evidence later, but if the evidence survives at trial, this would appear to bring them at any rate within the meaning pleaded in paragraph 5.2. And he says he has great difficulty in seeing how uh, those three claimants would be construed as uh, using any of the PR. So it's possible this could apply to one of the claimants, Elite Milan. And then he says he's not going to strike out the case because it may be that they, um, they will prevail at trial. And then 20, as to the third claim, it's said to have a responsibility worldwide for the Elite Model Look Contest and for its licensing and sponsorship arrangements. Again, some viewers are in reality likely to be aware of this. It's possible, therefore, that some reasonable viewers would have attributed one or more of the meanings pleaded at paragraph 5.2 to this corporate entity. In the light of this, it seems to me that all three of the claimants are just able, on the present state of the evidence, to squeak, uh, squeak home. So what we, what we can see here is what the judge is doing is he's looking at the message of the broadcast, and in this case, in the meanings, and he is looking at what the claimants do, and if you like, he's marrying up the two things. He's saying, well, you, you, have, to, you have to start with the meanings in a case like this where there's a complex corporate structure, and you then move on to see what the claimants do, and you see whether or not they have a case on, on reference uh, in the light of those meanings. That's exactly the exercise that Mr. Justice Nicklin carried out in the current case. And we say that is uncontroversial. That is the right way to go about it. He's identifying, as Justice Heedy, just as Mr. Justice Heedy identified the target of the allegations in Elite, that's exactly uh, what Mr. Justice Nicklin did in the current case. Um, the, uh, I've already addressed the question of um, acquaintance, uh, acquaintance with the claimant. Um, as we'll see when we come to the criticism of the judgment, that was something that the judge uh, had in mind when he, when he uh, reached the conclusion. He did refer to that explicitly. The um, question arises, uh, and I know this is a question which uh, my Lord Lord Justice will be um, um, asked uh, pointed to when giving um, permission to appeal, or, or what does that mean, a, a acquaintance with the claimant? And of course, it, it very much depends on, on the facts of, of the case. Um, but plainly, um, it, it can't, we say, mean you stray into extrinsic reference. It, it, it can't mean that the, um, that the claimant is entitled to pray and aid 
facts which only some viewers or readers would have known. So the court has to be careful to ensure that a case on acquaintance with the claimant is confined. Well, that's a real difficulty, isn't it? Because um, in almost every case, uh, there'll be people who don't know anything about the claimants. I mean, there are people, no doubt, many of them in the country who don't know who Dyson are as a group. I know nothing about their corporate structure, even if they know the brand. And so the if the intrinsic um, reference notion is to have any meaning at all as distinct from extrinsic reference. It must be something different from a restricted version of extrinsic. It just can't be something that everyone knows. Um, because otherwise um, you wouldn't have a claim in relation to as, as the authorities say you do if, if, if someone says the Prime Minister is a crook. There are people who don't know who the Prime Minister is. But, but everyone agrees that as a matter of law, that's a sufficient reference. Yes. So it's got to be something different. Uh, and what it is in each case is a matter for the, for the, for the judge. <coughs> so the, so ju just as um, uh, your Lordship decided in, in Undry that the uh, reasonable reader knew that Down to Earth London Limited didn't exist at the time of the events described in the words, a judge, in any other case, must decide what the reasonable reader acquainted with the claimant knew. Our point is that has to be um, uh, that exercise can't be an extravagant exercise, given the distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic reference. But it is a an exercise that the judges that the court is compelled to carry out in okay. an intrinsic reference case. So, sorry to interrupt. Um, um, wh wh why do we need to keep? extrinsic and intrinsic reference anyway. I mean, the old cases didn't. They, because, of course, they were just dealing with jury trials. And they just said, well, lots of people have identified. And you could make a proper case that actually this was all true in the endo in the sense you needed to plead that he was in Campbell for well and all, all, the, all the rest of it. And they just never got into that issue. And it's only now that we've separated juries from, from this process. That, that you're capable of coming up with these references. Uh, when was the first reference made to extrinsic and intrinsic? I, 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 that was this one. Uh, and, and what did that pick up? That picked up on reference to the false innuendos cases. And which one was that in? Um, I'll have to have a look. Sorry. At well, we're coming to we're coming to the <laughs> shortage. Yeah. It's not meant to be a test, but. But uh, it, what, what I was just asking, and would be very grateful for your assistance, I think Mr. Tomlinson said, well, it doesn't really matter, um, is whether, um, in the light of the question my Lord had identified on the papers, whether really it, intrinsic and extrinsic really does assist at all? Well, the, the, the short answer in our submission is there will be obvious cases where identification can only be established by evidence. Yeah. There, there will be cases which quite plainly fall into that category. There will, in our submission, equally be cases, equally obvious cases, where no, no, no evidence needs to be called in order to establish reference. Most cases fall into that category, indeed. Um, a claimant has to choose <laughs> whether, whether he uh, or she or it is going to advance a claim on the basis of intrinsic or extrinsic reference. Uh, that, is a, that is a decision. And, and as we've seen, that this, these claimants slightly struggled with it. But um, th that is a decision the, claim, the claimant needs to make um, with, with in mind what, what the claimant thinks he or she can establish with regard to the, what the reasonable reader knew. Um, so um, I think our answer is um, there is a continued role for the distinction. Um, and um, that is a matter which will become, um, in each case, the, the, the claimant has to make a decision about the way in which uh, he or she is going to prove their case at trial. But in most cases, it simply won't arise as an issue. It's, it's perfectly obvious. But the vast majority of defamation cases are intrinsic reference cases. It just, it's, it's, there's simply no need to call evidence. In order to establish, in order to establish identification, or 
obviously when it comes to damage, the question is a little different. Thank you. That probably brings us to pretty close to the, 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 the break. Um, it seems you're both making very good progress. How long do you guesstimate you're likely to be? Um, I think I'll be about another half an hour. Thank you. And whatever in reply? Less than that. Okay. Well, thank you both very much indeed, in which case we'll look forward to seeing you at 2 o'clock.